would you mind giving a formal introduction to the listeners of who and what you are according to you and also an introduction of who you are according to your good doctors and those who are your victims? Certainly. Hello, my name is H.G. Tudor. I am a greater elite narcissist. To the good doctors, I am a narcissistic sociopath. And to my victims, I am many different things. I understand that everything that you do is about fuel and, and narcissistic supply. So what is a day in H.G. Tudor's world like, if you don't mind sharing that? Certainly. Well, you're absolutely right. It revolves around gaining fuel from the various appliances. I have an extensive fuel network. So I have a primary source who is a girlfriend of mine who I don't live with, although many of our kind have primary sources that we do live with. So in my day, it might be the case that if I have stayed at my girlfriend's or she has stayed at mine, the first dollop of fuel I may receive will come from her in terms of her smiling at me when we wake up. I will then probably check one of my four phones for various messages, which will be of both a business nature, which will provide me with fuel in terms of people's reactions to things that I have done, be it good or bad. There will also be messages from other sources, such as friends who are secondary sources. So, for example, if they are asking if I'd like to attend an event and are enthusiastic about me attending, that will provide me with fuel. It may well be that I have received messages from other women that I'm cultivating as additional sources uh, that are flirtatious in nature. That will provide me with fuel. And then I will go through my day from showering, and getting ready for work, having my breakfast, talking to my girlfriend, which will again provide me with fuel. It might be that I decide to provoke her in some way to upset her because she's in the devaluation period at present. So if she becomes hurt or annoyed by a cutting remark I might make about the fact that she's burnt the toast, then as a consequence, I will gain fuel from her. I will then set off to work and I may choose to drive. And on the drive in, I may pull up at some traffic lights and see somebody alongside me. I may smile at them and they may smile back. That will give me fuel. I may cut somebody up and their angry reaction will give me fuel. And so on and so forth, it will go throughout the day with my colleagues that I interact with, with my clients, with my friends, with people that I meet in a bar for a drink after work, uh, from the person that I talk to in the queue when I go out to buy a sandwich at lunchtime. Each and every interaction is an opportunity for me to draw fuel from all of those around me, be it a primary source, the girlfriend, secondary sources, which are friends, colleagues, uh, <clears throat> and family, and tertiary sources, uh, strangers, acquaintances, the person who works in the coffee shop, etc. All of them have links to me, and I gain fuel from them in various levels of potency, uh, differing levels of frequency, and in varying levels in terms of quantity. And this goes on throughout the day. Wow, okay. Um, that, <laughs> that response triggered so many questions uh, that I don't have on the screen right now. Um, okay. So your, your girlfriend being your, your primary source. Yes. Does she have any idea what what you are? No. Wow. Is this a long term relationship that you've been in with her, or is this? Do you have? Uh, you know, do you just jump from primary source relationships to you know? Do you just jump to different ones, or do you? Is this somebody that you've been holding on to for a long time based on? the fuel that she provides? Uh, this relationship has uh, lasted for just over a year so far. Um, in terms of other relationships with primary sources, it can vary from a number of months to a few years. In, in my case, 
some people my nature may have the same primary source for quite a long period of time it all depends on the type of narcissist that they are it all depends on the fuel needs that they have it depends on the nature of the primary source if you have a codependent primary source that gains validation from their relationship with the narcissist even though they may not recognize that themselves they will cling on to that relationship for a long time and they may suffer an extensive period of devaluation 10 20 years and that uh, in that instance the narcissist may well be repeatedly unfaithful with other, be unfaithful with other people but the primary source remains in place because of their desire to remain attached. They have no willingness or desire to escape. They don't understand the situation that they are in. They will recognize that they are hurt and they will want to try and resolve the situation. They will want to try and make it better. They want to try and fix. But these are all empathic traits. And that's inherent to the type of people that we target those that will give us the fuel that we need, those who are more susceptible to being seduced, those who are easy to bind to us, and those that will remain in the relationship for as long as we deem that it's necessary. In my personal research, I have found that the prenatal environment and the first seven years of a person's life sets the foundational stage for the way a person will live the rest of their life. Do you know anything about the environment your mother was in while she was pregnant with you? If so, would you say the environment was toxic? And after you were born, would you say that the most traumatic experiences happened to you within the first seven years? And if so, do you feel those situations are the main reasons you have become a narcissist? And are you open to sharing any of those situations that caused you to disconnect from your identity and create a false self? I know very little about the environment that my mother was in whilst she was pregnant with me. Um, <clears throat> so I, I wouldn't be able to say precisely what the nature of that environment was at the time. I understand that she had a difficult relationship with her father. So I suspect that there was uh, some degree of toxicity there, but it's not something that's been talked about extensively. Uh, in terms of after, when I was born, uh, the most traumatic experiences happened to me within the first nine years of my life. And I've come to learn that those situations are indeed the main reasons why I am what I am now. <clears throat> I didn't know that until I engaged with the good doctors. They are the ones that have enabled me to link what happened to me as a child with the creation of what i have become. I recognize that I took certain uh, proactive actions when I was younger in order to try and change the course of the way that I was treated by identifying the methodology that my uh, primary abuser, which was my mother, used and decided that since she um, gained such respect and fear and admiration from all around her, that rather than try to fight against it or to be crushed under it, it seemed to me to be entirely appropriate to mimic the way that she behaved and I've re come to realize now that my mimicking of her was essentially then the catalyst for what I have become. In terms of the actual situations that caused me to uh, disconnect from my identity, I would prefer not to go into the detail of them, but I will say that during my childhood I was subjected to physical, emotional and sexual abuse but I have since learned to conquer those abuses. For people to identify where they or others fall on the narcissistic spectrum, can you explain what lesser, mid-range, greater, and victim narcissists are and their characteristics? Can you also explain what a codependent is? And also, what are geyser, magnet, 
carrier and super empaths? What are the differences between a narcissist, a sociopath, and a psychopath from your understanding? That covers a considerable body of material. So <clears throat> with that preface, I will endeavor to be succinct. I've identified as a consequence of my own understanding of my situation, years of interaction with those of my kind, because there are other narcissists in my family. I've worked with them, they're in my social groups, and of course I come into contact with them uh, in day-to-day -day dealings. I have also ensured that I understand my victims inside out in order to become highly effective at what I do. And as a consequence of my uh, natural intellect, these observations, and lastly, the additional information I've received from the good doctors, this has enabled me to look at this narcissistic spectrum, whereby to the left, you have the uh, empathic group, which consists of codependence, the super empath and the empath. So if we deal with a codependent first, I detail this far more extensively in my book, Chained. But essentially, the codependent is somebody that gains validation in terms of their purpose and identity by binding themselves to a narcissist. My sister is one, and I observed that essentially, the codependent starts off on a route to become one of my kind, but for some reason, and I'm not sure what it is, that pathway alters. So in order to deal with the situation that they find themselves in, which invariably is something linked to abuse or trauma, rather than taking, as I did, they defend themselves by giving. And the codependent essentially needs the umbrella of a narcissist in order to survive. And therefore, if they are without a narcissist, they will go and find one. They will not necessarily know that that individual is a narcissist, but rather they will feel a feel that they are drawn to particular behaviors and traits which arise out of their own codependency issues it's quite a complex situation but in a nutshell that's what it revolves around a super empath is somebody who has significant empathic traits but also narcissistic traits and with those individuals their empathic traits outweigh their narcissistic traits so they are kind and they're honest and they're decent. They want to help people. They believe in the truth and they're loved devotees, etc. However, there comes a point whereby if they are pushed and pushed and pushed, their empathic traits dim temporarily. They're not eroded, they're not switched off, but they're dimmed, which allows their narcissistic traits to come to the fore. And this is called the empathic supernova. And in effect, this is when this particular type of empath kicks ass and decides that the behavior they've been subjected to, again, they may not know that they're with a narcissist that just recognize the behavior is wrong and they say enough is enough and they will fight back. And rather than try to please the narcissist or their abuser, rather than necessarily walk away, they will fight back in order to secure their freedom, to teach the abuser a lesson. And once achieved, they will then often leave the uh, relevant narcissist, if, uh, particularly if a lesser or a mid-range narcissist, abandoned, starved of fuel, and suf suffering a fuel crisis. So a super empath is a particularly attractive character to our kind, because on the one hand, he or she oozes with fuel. They are often quite successful people as well. So they have many traits that we would like to call as our own. Um, they may, for example, be a professor or a sports person or successful in business or a good singer, know a lot about the world or travel extensively. And that's appealing to us because we like to steal the traits from our victims and pass them off as our own as part of creating our construct. They also will have considerable residual benefits. They are probably well off financially. They will have a large social group. They will have a house that we might want to move into, a car that they let us use, and so on and so forth. So a super empath has many attracting factors, but there is a risk 
that a less evolved and uh, sophisticated narcissist could well find his or her fingers burnt because the super empath at a point will say enough is enough, go supernova and escape the narcissist. An empath is essentially somebody with empathic traits and very few narcissistic traits. Uh, they, again, believe in honesty and decency. Uh, they wish to seek the truth. Um, they uh, <clears throat> are love devotees and have a whole range of empathic traits. And as a consequence of this, this means that they provide us with excellent fuel. So all of those in the empathic group, codependent, super empaths and empaths, have empathic traits, provide us with fuel, but the manner of their dynamic with us will vary. Now, into, you mentioned uh, carrier and magnet. They are layers to the various types of empath. So you have with the magnet empath is somebody who is highly charismatic, uh, turns heads, uh, causes people to be very much attracted to them, uh, enters a room and everybody notices, but not in a narcissistic manner, but in a way whereby they will reach out to somebody and uh, by the way that they touch them on their arm, they make people feel special. And they do it because they want to do it for other people rather than purely for themselves, which is what we would do. A, a carrier empath is like a tank. Uh, this individual, very practical, has considerable reserves of moral strength and character, can absorb a lot of abuse, always looks for solutions to problems, uh, is ready to help out, ready to roll up their sleeves and wade in in order to resolve problems for people and will keep going and going and going until a sudden point of collapse. So whilst you have your uh, schools of empath, which are codependent super empath and empath, you then have these layers on top, uh, which are applicable to all of the schools, uh, which are, if you like, particular flavours which uh, we recognise in terms of, for example, a carrier empath may suit a particular type of narcissist because this person is extremely practical and caring, whereas a magnet uh, empath uh, may appeal to, say, a greater narcissist who wants to be seen with somebody who is extremely socially engaging and charismatic. Turning to the other end of the spectrum, you then have the narcissistic group. And these are the individuals which have many and strong narcissistic traits and no empathy. So you have the lesser, the mid-range and the greater. And again, there's a huge body of work that I've written about with regard to these schools. But essentially, the lesser is an individual of a lower cognitive function, tends to use physical violence as a method of manipulation, is often unsuccessful in endeavours, with employment, but not necessarily so, tends to have a very low control threshold on his fury, and therefore, when wounded by criticism, erupts, and often with heated fury, which means shouting, violence, breaking things. The mid-range narcissist is passive-aggressive in nature. His or her hallmark is the extensive use of silent treatments, cold shoulders, uh, suddenly vanishing. They like to engage in pity plays and involving other people to do their dirty work for them. They have a reasonable degree of control over their fury, but it's not great. So when pushed, they will erupt. It tends to be cold fury, silent treatments, etc. They have a degree of charm and some calculation. Both lesser and mid-range narcissists do not know what they are. They do not understand what they are, they have no awareness, nor will they ever have any awareness. A greater narcissist is a particularly calculated, charming and intelligent individual who is aware of what he or she is, either has been pointed in the right direction by some well-meaning individual to tell them that the, they are a particular uh, narcissist, or they recognise that their behaviours are such that they are significantly different to everybody else, and they know that they essentially get off on the reactions of people through manipulation. Now, in terms of sociopath and psychopath, they fall into the greater category. There is considerable confusion, however, I've noticed, 
in terms of what people understand by sociopath and psychopath. And it seems to me that there is actually uh, various shades that can be drawn from both, uh, both types. Generally speaking, I come to understand that a psychopath is somebody who is essentially born that way and does not know the difference between right and wrong. Whereas a sociopath has been created by environment and does understand the difference between right and wrong, but doesn't care. I think both of those are fairly rudimentary descriptions. And I think as with much in this world, there are varying degrees and shades that are applicable to them. It's interesting because I've been diagnosed as a narcissistic sociopath, which seems to accord as a consequence of the upbringing that I had. But I know from discussions with other people that they consider that I might be better described as a psychopath. So it depends very much on who you might talk to in the relevant field uh, of psychiatry or psychology as to what they determine. But essentially, the way that I look at it is that be it sociopath or psychopath, you're dealing with an individual that will stop at nothing to get his or her way, that sees fuel as the be all and, and, and end all, that people are just appliances that will be there to be utilized for the, for the greater uh, good of the narcissist, that the individual concerned is highly calculating, extremely manipulative, very charming, tends to rely on charm to get his or her way, tends to rely on threat and intimidation, but can be prone to excessive and extreme violence if they deem that it's necessary. A lot of graters are very uh, aware of the facade that they've created and how ensuring that they control their fury in appropriate circumstances is entirely appropriate to avoid damaging the facade. So whereas a lesser might erupt, say, at a party, and start uh, punch somebody and throw plates around and doesn't care that everybody thinks he's being uh, an idiot. He merely is content because he gains the horrified reaction of those around him, which gives him fuel. The greater knows that if he starts uh, smashing up the plates at a charity do, people are going to uh, think less of him, which will diminish his facade. So instead, he will control his fury and look to deal with the person that has wounded him, which has caused the ignition of fury at a later date, when perhaps there's only him and that individual around and nobody to witness what is done. So that's essentially the main traits of all of those things, but it's an extremely wide ranging area. And I've written a lot about all of, all of these and there's plenty more detail that one can go into your breakdown of the differences between the sociopath and psychopath that was the first time i've i've heard that before the the way that you explained it and um definitely something that i i want to understand more because i was under the assumption that you you were labeled as a psychopath but um in looking deeper i i, I read where you put that you're a sociopath and um, the narcissistic traits that fall under these categories, it makes it kind of hard to distinguish, but by you expressing how the sociopath is pretty much created based on their environment and the psychopath is born that way, uh, that's, that just kind of opened my eyes up to other pieces of information that I learned. So um, I'm going to yes. go deeper into that and, and thank you for, for sharing that. Not at all. You see, it's interesting, though, because in terms of the uh, sociopathic element, that's certainly my upbringing would accord with that. But I've been told by other people in the field that the way that I function in terms of being highly calculating and exerting control is not necessarily typical of sociopaths because they tend to be a little bit more haphazard at times, uh, furtive and uh, anxious. I don't suffer from anxiety. I become rest restless if my fuel levels drop. But as with everything, you're, I think it's a case of that we like to put labels on things to assist understanding. And you're always going to get individuals, be it on my side of the fence or 
on the empathic side that will not fit neatly into a category and you can draw elements from different parts uh, in order to describe somebody. So you might find somebody that's on the cusp of a particular school or cadre of uh, narcissist. So there are those distinctions. And that's why I have categorised in terms of lesser, mid-range and greater as a consequence of, that's purely my categorization. I emphasise, I'm not a psychologist. I have no training or academic background in that regard. My academic background is in a completely different direction. But why haven't I done it in that way is to enable people to understand more readily the correct way uh, of assessing the person that they are with for the purposes of understanding how they will behave and why they behave by putting it in terms which are effectively communicated. Because I think at times there is a risk that if we go into the realms of the scientific, which is entirely appropriate for the practitioners which are trained in that regard, but for everybody else who's outside of that, esoteric terms can often be quite unhelpful. And when people are directed to more formal texts to determine is somebody a narcissist, they may read what they, read, they see there and think, but how does that link into what I've been experiencing? what I've been attempting to do because of my perspective of being a great narcissist is to say to people, this is how I think. I also know how others of my kind think because they're in my family and I've grown up around them and some of them are friends and colleagues. So I can tell you how we behave, what we think and what we will do, but I will tell you in a way that is easier for you to understand than having to digest purely scientific terms. Yeah, your way of, of breaking it down um, definitely helped me to to understand, and uh, it just it did make it much easier to uh, to integrate all of the information and the wide the wide range spectrum of uh, narcissism and uh, empaths and codependence and and all of that. Yeah. So that's I know that that's very helpful to a lot of people. I personally have come across people that have very high codependent traits, but they are also highly narcissistic. So how would you explain a codependent who becomes or acts highly narcissistic in their behavior? Which one of your titles best fits them? I haven't come across an individual who is codependent who becomes highly narcissistic in their behavior. That's not to say, I suppose, that it couldn't happen. I think perhaps in those circumstances that you've probably got somebody who actually isn't a codependent, but is a super empath. The super empath will still exhibit a lot of empathy. And as I mentioned, when their empathy becomes dimmed and the narcissistic traits come through, that is when you have the supernova moment. Um, I've not experienced a situation where a codependent becomes narcissistic because they have so few narcissistic traits to begin with. And it's not something that you're going to acquire when you're an adult. The formation of your traits, be they empathic or narcissistic, occur in childhood. I know some people talk about uh, the concept of narcissistic fleas, that you can somehow become contaminated by your experience with the narcissist so that you start to behave in a similar way. I don't necessarily subscribe to that point of view. The way I look at it is you probably have those narcissistic traits to begin with, but they've been hidden by your empathic ones. So if you imagine you have a searchlight and a candle and the candle is lit, you can barely see the light from the candle because the searchlight is so much more powerful. Dim the searchlight, you can then see the candlelight more readily. And I think that's what happens. So if you have an individual who is empathic, but starts to exhibit narcissistic traits, they haven't acquired them as a consequence of their entanglement, but rather their empathy has become eroded and dimmed as a consequence of the repeated exposure to the behavior of the narcissist so that their inherent narcissistic traits come to the fore, quite possibly as a form of defense mechanism for the victim. Okay, I totally understand that 
that answer that you gave and I I should be a little bit more clear in, in the question because from from my perspective um, I know I spoke with you well I emailed you about um, human design which is just the, the study of the DNA codons that make up our genetic blueprints as, as human individuals and yes. in, in studying the DNA matrix of us as human beings that you know everybody pretty much possesses um, I've been able to find the the narcissistic um, DNA codons and also the codependent DNA codons and um, from my understanding speaking from human design with the codependent traits and characteristics um, these are people that if, if they don't have a, a partner or if they don't have someone that they are latched on to to feel secure, um, yes. they, they don't function. They're, they're incapable of functioning as an independent person who trusts in themselves to be able to, you know, survive in the world. They use narcissistic tactics most of the time, like they gaslight and they um use the word salad they um they a lot of them operate as lessers like the way that you explain less lesser narcissists these are people that i can tell that they really are not aware of what they're doing yes. but it's like these codependents that i'm speaking of they're not empathic <laughs> like they don't have those empathic traits so i don't even know where to place them based on your terms well, it's interesting that you say that they don't have any empathic traits because what you might actually be dealing with is an individual who is actually a narcissist. 